good to go. Awesome. Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for um, February's faculty speaker series. Uh, we are here to discuss PhD and DNP collaboration uh, and how Abby and I have applied this co-teaching model to 200W. Next slide, please. Um, I love to follow directions, so I'm going to read this verbatim for all of you, so bear with me. Um, disclosures, attendance at this activity today can earn one contact hour through Penn State's Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing. To receive one contact hour, you must attend the program in full and complete the evaluation provided at the end of the program. Penn State Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing is approved with distinction as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by Pennsylvania State Nurses Association and accredited approver by the American Nurses Credentialing Centers Commission and Accreditation. The topic of this education is non-clinical and therefore we did not identify, mitigate, or disclose relevant financial relationships. And Abby and I have nothing to disclose today. Thanks, Bree. You did the hard work there. <laughs> and uh, what kind of educators would we be if we did not provide you with objectives to get us started? Um, by the end of our time together today, Abby and I hope that you as participants are able to discuss the value of both DNP and PhD collaboration in the academic setting. Uh, we want to discuss best practices for co-teaching in higher ed and then discuss how interdiscipline or interdegree collaboration and co-teaching can apply to our current curriculum. And many of you that are here already know us, but we'll take this opportunity to introduce ourselves. My name is Brianna Blackburn. You can call me Bree. This is my fourth year here at Penn State, and I am a third year PhD student um, at Penn State. I am in my final semester of coursework and will begin full-time dissertation work this summer. Uh, my clinical background is med surge telemetry, and I listed some of the courses that I teach here. And I'm really happy to be here with my colleague, Abby. And I know most of you, thank you for coming today. Um, my name is Abby Hackenberger and I, you can call me Abby. I've been here at Penn State for six years and um, I am DNP prepared. I'm happy to say graduated with that under my belt two years ago. My clinical background is in um, critical care nursing and I still work uh, at the bedside in that area as well. And you can also see the courses that I teach currently as well as your fearless CBET leader. <laughs> Gotta keep that there. Next slide, please. Okay, so now that we've talked a little bit about who we are, we would like to engage you guys in some open discussion for the next few minutes and just sort of uh, pick your brains and see where we're at. So. Feel free to unmute yourself um, and participate. Our first question here is, how would you explain the difference between a PhD and a DNP to a lay person, like someone that isn't a nurse or doesn't really understand the difference? And I, I'm sure all of you have to do this to family members all the time. I don't think mine still understand what it means. <laughs> Anybody have any thoughts? What, what I um, explain to people, and you try, you try to keep it really simple because nursing is known for having a gazillion degrees at many levels. So I basically say that the DNP, they're both doctorates. One, the focus is practice, and the other one is research that could be in practice or any other realm of education. Um, and most of the time they do not get it, even with that. You're so right. And Kelly said in the chat, PhD is a research degree to cultivate new knowledge. The DNP is a practice degree to help guide and lead quality improvement in healthcare. Perfect. Anybody else have anything different? I try to say a combo of those, but with less words. <laughs> they still look at you like, what are you saying? 
Great. Well, uh, thank you for getting us started. So with those definitions in mind, let's discuss the DMP prepared nurse and what specific knowledge and skills that nurse can bring to the academic setting. What are your thoughts? I think we have a, a mixture here, so we should be able to bring some um, different perspectives forward, maybe better so than our students do on Zoom, everyone. <laughs> um, this is Maureen. I know from my perspective, when um, I finished my degree, I felt more prepared. I have a DNP. Um, when I was planning my lessons, um, explaining the content, looking at the pedagogy of how I was going to teach. I felt it really helped me in enhancing my um, capabilities in teaching as well as how I explain things to the students. Thanks, Maureen. I'm in the chat, let's see. Um... So Kelly, leadership, quality improvement, safety, policy, informatics, financial management, evidence-based practice. Beth Ann, DNP brings the clinical expert to teaching. Sydney, implementation. Beth Ann, PhD, brings new research. Um, Kelly, I like what Maureen said, DNPs bring current evidence into practice. Carrie, leadership, quality initiatives. Excellent. And it kind of helps you have the bigger picture, right? When you come to the classroom, bring that whole picture together for you. That's what I've found at least. Okay, great. Yeah, and then uh, Beth Ann already kind of got us started on the next question, but what about the PhD prepared nurse? Like what specific knowledge and skills do they bring to the table? Great point, Maybe Kelly. From start to finish, love yeah. that. Anybody else? Okay, great, Beth Ann, PhD generates new knowledge and the DNP takes it to clinical practice. Great. Great. Uh, we will continue the dis discussion on the next slide. Darcy, if you would move us forward. So since we've identified the two uh, separate knowledge and skills, what do you think the benefits are to bringing these skill sets together? So let's start with what does this benefit the nursing profession at large? We'll only make you work for another couple minutes and then we will let you off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think together they bring the expertise of what nursing is all about practice we're never we're always a practice um profession and the phd helps us look at that practice and define what we need to do to research in order to support have that evidence-based practice and i think it's a perfect pairing when you're doing research i agree ray okay um so Sydney, moving evidence-based research into practice. Carrie says nursing knowledge dissemination. David, um, in, an, oops, in an ideal world, bringing research findings to practice implementation brings theory and practice together from Kelly. Leslie says integration of experience perspectives with research and application. And Beth Ann, bridge the gap that new knowledge is generated to avoid the typical eight to 15 years before it goes into practice. Absolutely. Bethann, if you were in class in person, I would be like giving you a piece of candy because you nailed it. <laughs> um, and that moves us on to the second piece of this question is how does this benefit our students? Which is what we all really care about here, right? Give students something to aspire to. We hope so, absolutely. Um, 
I'm going to add to Kelly's comment and say role modeling, like having a person that kind of embodies all these different paths that they may choose to take in their own future. Jen, yes, it exposes them to both perspectives and different career paths. I think one of the biggest challenges is that the student right now is focused on practice. They want to be able to have that hands-on. I want to be able to do, but by integrating this in, it at least exposes them to it. And we're really watching them transition until they graduate. And hopefully it's going to, um, they're going to remember this integration uh, and the importance of practice and um, the research that supports that practice. Agreed. So lots of benefits here and we appreciate your uh, participation, but it also wouldn't be complete if we didn't discuss some of the potential challenges that can come with this sort of collaboration. So uh, let's finish our discussion here just with a couple thoughts on what you think could be challenging bringing these two different expertises together. No challenges. <laughs> it's very easy. Okay, we, I bet we all know, I bet we all know students and how much they love research. And that brings challenges. We're going to talk about that, that right? That's in itself. But by doing this, I think that you bridge some of those challenges. Because if it was only a research course, and I've done both, so it it is just like they do not see the value of it at this point in their career. That is the biggest challenge for sure. And in the chat, kind of blowing up with what we all have seen and felt, respecting the balance, one is not better than the other, from Leslie. Carrie, making it understandable. Research is like a foreign language to students. Beth Ann, I love this, a turf battle about which is better. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you all for participating. I think that we could spend an entire hour just discussing all of these questions, but we will move on and just like to keep these questions in the back of your mind as we continue to talk today. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna give a little bit of background to what sort of has driven Abby and I's interest in PhD and DNP collaboration in the academic setting. Um, and a lot of it can be summarized in this NLN call to action from April of 2018. It's titled Doctor, Doctoral Faculty Collaboration in Nursing Education. And uh, I've been a member of the NLN for a while now, even prior to my employment at Penn State. But they put out a, a lot of documents and they are very active. And I have to admit that I didn't know this existed until probably two years ago. Um, and what I like about this is it is a living document. Um, it's constantly being updated. So don't let that April 2018 date fool you. Um, and it really acknowledges the changing landscape of doctorate education in nursing. And uh, on the next slide, I've highlighted some of the, oh, before I get there, uh, the really guiding question to this document. Um, Sorry, Darcy, go ahead to the next slide. I got ahead of myself. You did great. Um, is how can the nursing profession instill the belief that the roles and scholarship of the practice and research doctorate are different and that within the profession, there is a place for both degrees? And I just want to pause here and really let that sink in because I find this to be a very powerful question and something that I think we all need to ask ourselves and do a little bit of inner reflection. Um, and I wanna emphasize the last part that there is a place for both degrees and take that a step further that not only is there a place, but we have an opportunity to really boost each other and leverage the strengths of each degree to benefit not only the profession, but this, our students and their futures as well. 
Next slide, please. So there's a lot of words on this slide, uh, but I felt it was important to outline some of the recommendations that the NLN put in this document. And they organized their call to action um, in three different parts. So what are they asking faculty to do? So us, what are they asking our leaders? So deans, directors, and chairs to do? And then what are they going to hold themselves accountable to as the NLN? So I will not read this to you word for word, but really our responsibility as faculty is to explore ways to build like collaborative efforts together in academia between the DNP and the PhD prepared nurse and really embrace the strengths of both. And then how can we like move that forward into additional opportunities? And the call for our leaders is to make that exploration, like make sure it's supported, create an environment where it's embraced and make sure that hiring practices um, reflect both degrees being represented in, the, in their environment. And then for the NLN, providing funding, scholarships, um, and promoting leadership programs that support this kind of collaboration in the academic environment. Next slide. So uh, Abby and I became aware of that NLN document and both felt very inspired and felt that we had an opportunity to push this forward here at Penn State in our College of Nursing. So um, part of my master's degree program, I explored co-teaching models and uh, felt this was a prime opportunity to kind of bring together collaboration with a co-teaching model. So if you're unfamiliar with co-teaching, um, I thought this was a nice visual. Um, even if you've not been formally trained on what co-teaching is, most likely you've experienced it as a learner. And co-teaching is sort of a broad term and it is sometimes used interchangeably with these words across the bottom. So team teaching or parallel teaching. And really what it means is you have two or more educators in one classroom. So how you utilize those two educators looks differently depending on the model. And not all models are suitable for all classrooms. Um, and there is choice uh, to how you wish to use the model. But you can see that the one on the left is a one teach, one support kind of model. Parallel teaching is both teaching at the same time. Station teaching, which is something that's used often in K through 12. And then team teaching is where like both instructors are teaching together at the front of the room. So like I said, no model is better than the other. They're each suited for you know different types of education, but I wanted to provide this visual for you to kind of start seeing what this could look like in a classroom setting. Next slide, please. And co-teaching is not a new practice. This is something that has been in the literature for many years. Um, it's used heavily in K through 12 education, um, but it's also used quite a bit in um, our colleagues in medical school and in their teaching models. Uh, and there's been a significant amount of research completed on like what makes co-teaching work or not work in higher education. So I've just pulled together here a couple of the common themes between that literature and what is seen as best practice. So when you have two leaders in a room full of students, it's really important that those faculty members have established trust and uh, very strong communication with each other and not only with each other, but then also a singular message that's communicated to their students. And with that, also a singular goal and vision for what you want the students to learn, what the learning environment should be like. And then a big one that I saw in the literature is this third piece, which is not only are you on the same page as your co-instructor, but how do you make sure that your students are also on board with this model and being very clear about your approach with students right out of the gate. So from day one, they know what this model is all about, who their instructors are, what their indiv individual roles are, and how it's gonna benefit them as a student. Like we really do have to sell this 
to students. Um, this is not just an opportunity to like split the workload in half uh, for instructors. This needs to be intentionally planned and play upon each instructor's strength. And then there needs to be a balance between consistency and flexibility since this is a you know, newer and less familiar teaching model. Next slide. So I will take over here to talk with all of you about the co-teaching model that Bree and I have used for 200W here at Penn State. So um, this is just one example, and this is just from our experience so far. We have done this um, last spring, and now we're currently teaching again um, this spring. So we have two instructors, but we teach in one classroom. And I just want to highlight some of the considerations and how we implemented those based on the best practices that Bree just discussed with you. So first, um, our syllabi. So we have one joint syllabus with consistent expectations for all. So Bree and I have um, a brainstorming session every winter before we go off on break and we hash out all of the details. We make sure that we know exactly what we're doing so that all of our messaging and all of our um, uh, interactions with students are consistent. Um, we give them one syllabus. We have joint and individual office hours and time for feedback. Um, we make sure that there is a lot of opportunity for feedback, both optional and required. We make sure to highlight how to contact us. So the way we do it here is certain students are um, assigned to a section. And so either we make the roster or it's assigned in line path, but we um, just to keep the grading consistent, we keep those students that have been assigned to us. And we communicate that with the student that they can CC both of us on an email. If it's a grading question, then always email the, um, the faculty member who has done your grading because that will stay the same throughout the semester. Um, but we use rubrics to make sure that that does stay consistent and make sure that we always communicate with them how to reach us and who to reach for what item. Um, of course, we know that students care most about their grades. So evaluation really needs to be taken seriously if you're using a co-teaching model. Um, the use of rubrics for consistency, and we maintain consistency with all of the other 200W classes that are taught across our campuses. So we all use the same rubrics. Um, we keep the same graders every time and give those frequent opportunities for copious amounts of feedback, both optional and required opportunities for those. So we really focus on staying consistent, being clear, um, and just working to merge the sections to make it feel like one cohesive class, but make sure that they get all of the attention that they need because there are two of us. Next slide, please, Darcy. Um, whenever we look at content coverage and course design, we make sure to equally distribute the workload, which is um, one of the perks, of course, it's great to have someone to always bounce ideas off of um, and make sure that, you know, we really play to our strengths here. Um, we lay out all of the content and who will cover it at the beginning of the semester. So we have a clear plan for that going forward. Um, we maintain transparency with the students. So we really try to allow them to be really knowledgeable and understand why we've chosen the model we've chosen along with why we've chosen the content that we each cover. So we try to really explain to them um, our, our areas of expertise, our areas of knowledge. Um, we maintain a lot of humility. There are many things that Bree is very good at that I am not very good at. Um, so honestly, it works out so nicely if um, you can acknowledge that you're, you each bring strength to the classroom. And we are very um, forthcoming with that information to the students. Um, so just, you know, that clarity with them about the split. Um, we do, this semester at least, we've merged our Canvas course. Last year, we made the terrible error to keep separate Canvas courses. This was a rookie mistake for sure. 
because then we had to copy all of our messages and do everything double. So that was not so smart. So we, we're learning. Um, so we've merged our Canvas courses. So we have one Canvas to manage. And that, again, adds to that consistency and um, you know ease of messaging and all of that communication stuff. Um, we are very intentional when splitting course material. So things that Brie has covered in her PhD world um, versus my DNP world um, are really delineated. Um, but we are present for each other's content and we can add in, you know, as we go through through that with the students. Um, so we use our strengths and experiences and we have that schedule layout and we give that to them ahead of time so they really know um, what's happening and what to expect. Next slide, please, Darcy. We're really excited to talk about the next steps because I told you this is our second semester of doing this. Um, we did it last spring and it went really well, but we really only had kind of anecdotal um, SRT feedback. Uh, students really seemed to like it. They liked the co-teaching model. They liked what we both brought to the table. So this year we've decided to partner with Shire. Um, Institute for Teaching Excellence, and we're doing a scholarship of teaching and learning study to assess um, how this redesigned course layout uh, affects the nursing students' beliefs and perceptions of nursing research. So we're really excited about that. We have worked with um, Laura Cruz to adapt a version of the Attitudes Towards Research survey and we're doing a pre and post design. So we've already given the pre-survey. And we also have been lucky enough to have um, Leslie Womeldorf participate with us at um, one, with one of her sections at University Park um, as a control group. So we're going to really look at, um, is there any impact based on what we're doing um, with how they feel about nursing research? I don't know what that will show, but we are really excited to get a little bit more of a formal feedback piece from them. So that's where we're at right now. And we are in what, week five-ish, four-ish. Um, so, so far, so good. Um, next slide, please, Darcy. So really our goals for today were, and, and moving forward, but kind of to open up the conversation with all of you, um, to facilitate that collaborative teaching model within our college. Um, I can't speak for Brie, but I know that I have found so many benefits to it, not only for students, but for myself, um, to learn from another educator, to see how someone else does it, to build my strengths and really build that trusting relationship between us um, has been really wonderful, I think, professionally for me. Um, so I think it would be a wonderful thing for us to continue to build within our college between degrees, between faculty, um, would be wonderful. And to acknowledge and utilize different skill sets, training, and expertise to improve that student experience, because that is the real world. When they get out there, they will see every different type of degree under the sun. So the more we can expose them to that in their program, in the undergraduate world, um, I think can only bring benefit and a more well-rounded educational experience to them. So those are our goals moving forward. And we hope that because you're here, you are interested in continuing to look at that within our college. Um, next slide, please, Darcy. And there are references. We can move to the last slide and we can have some time. We have intentionally left um, some time for questions, discussion. Um, we would really like to hear your thoughts if you use co-teaching or, you know, what, what you're thinking after all of this. And I saw Kelly. Um, when during the semester will you be administering the survey? Um, Oh, that's a good idea to tell Alex about the timing. We have a lot of surveys happening with students. And then do you use each other to give a second grade opinion when necessary? Really good questions. Um, so during this semester, we have already administered one survey and then we can talk with Alex about that second survey. What did we say, Brie, like the last? The last two weeks of the semester. And then do we use each other to give second grade opinion when necessary? Yes, we do. Um, we absolutely 
kind of eyeball all of the students who we are feeling kind of like, do they need more support? Um, if we have questions, we are in constant communication. I think our text message numbers probably double just with the amount we talk to each other in the spring semester. Um, so yes, we do. We utilize each other in a lot of different ways. And we tell the students that sometimes we may, you know, kind of cross reference. So they're prepared for that. Okay. Um, Ray, I see your hand is raised. I, I think there's two things with this type of teaching. There's the pedagogy that is the basis of why we're doing it. And, and I'm 100% for that. And then I think there's the logistics of doing it. And um, I know that I talked to both of you before. And so you have to fit within the guidelines of the university. So for example, a very simple thing is that university with a writing intensive course has a cap of 25. So how do you do that when Hershey, you have what, 50, 60 students um, in that? So looking at that. So I did talk with the um, Office of Undergraduate Education because I didn't know if this um, would come up as a red flag in the course scheduling that all um, that your cap was different than it should be. And you could do just two sections at the same time, but at university probably be a little more difficult because we'd have to have different classrooms and all that trickle down. So sometimes the devil is in the details. But when I talked to Jeff um, Adams about this, who is the vice provost for undergraduate education, he wants to really have um, a summary from the two of you of, as how this has happened. Because I suggested that maybe we look at it almost as a like we do clinicals. We have one section has all the lecture and stuff in it. And then we have, they sign up for sections where they need individual feedback because that reiteration is the um, strength of the writing intensive course. So I think that that's implementing it on other campuses might be challenging if they don't have larger cohorts to do that. Um, but the co-teaching I think is is great. I think pedagogically, it's sound and it also, you bring up an excellent point and that is that the two of you have had to be right on that you, because the biggest problem with co-teaching before that has come to my attention as an administrator is students say, I would have gotten a better grade if the other person would have graded things. So um, being very clear on that and the rubrics and all of that, I think that's all helpful. Uh, and I do want to give some credit to all of the people that came before us in 200W that put in the work to develop the rubrics and things like that. I don't want to be misleading at all and make it seem like we created all of this from scratch. Uh, we really have just taken the like course shell of 200W and have put it into a co-teaching model. We really recognize that we are in a unique position being at the Hershey campus. We do have larger lecture halls available to us. Um, and currently, like we do have 60 third year students enrolled. So Abby and I have split that down the middle and we each have 30 students a piece that we're responsible for grading for, which really is very doable um, and feels very on par with what we experienced last year. Uh, fully recognize that the numbers are different and logistics are different for other folks at other campuses, but um, that is how it's worked out for us here. And Marianne asked if the EBP project assignment has changed in this format. It has not changed at all. Um, we just have had to make sure we have enough um, final presentation slots and signups and days. Um, but otherwise, the project is the same exact project that every other 200W course uses. Thank you. I, I asked that question um, because we look at quality improvement projects in addition to like traditional research projects. And I think having both of you teaching the course will help to kind of infuse, let them see the big picture. And it, we might actually see more blending of, you know, the articles that the students end up selecting for the project. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Um, okay, Kelly. What do you think will happen with the new CSEEQ process? Um, as far as what, Kelly? 
You mean just in terms of evaluation of the course? Yes. Do you think your survey process will be redundant to what the seek is, or are there going to be some overlaps? And are you going to compare then the survey results to what you then see in the seek results? We, you can speak to the sur the survey probably much better than I can. Uh, the survey we selected is called the attitude towards research scale. So it's not just like, what was your experience in the classroom? Like this is really narrowing down to the undergraduate nursing students attitude towards research. And we collected that data at the beginning of the semester and then we'll collect it again at the end. So I don't think there's much overlap between the SEEQ. Um, we are hopeful since, you know, participation in both the research survey that we're deploying as well as the SEEQ is optional. And I know how it is at the end of the semester, our students are overwhelmed, they have a lot of deliverables. I hope that we can encourage them and provide them with the opportunity to complete these with intentionality so that we get good feedback from them. That's my biggest concern is like the number of participation. Um, we did have 57 out of our 60 students participate in the pre-survey at the beginning of the semester. And then another good question from Kelly, will you generally talk about what you know happens when students talk among themselves and compare grades? What strategies do you take early in the course to help reduce that stress among students? Um, I think again, speaking to utilizing the rubrics, we go over the rubrics with the students and make sure that they know exactly what our expectations are. We show them examples of successful papers, um, we really have tried even more this year to highlight the exactly what we want from them. Um, so that is our number one mitigation strategy. Um, number two, I think always touching base with one another to make sure that if we have a question, like I'm seeing this a lot, are you seeing this a lot? Maybe this is something we didn't touch upon well enough. Maybe this is an us issue um, more than a student issue or, you know, always being in constant communication about what we are finding while grading so that we can address that on the larger scale and try to mitigate that chatter <laughs> that I'm sure happens regardless. Um, but we, we just really try to stay consistent with how we evaluate them and what we expect from them. And Brie, you can um, add. Yeah, I'll add that uh, when we grade something that is like a pretty large evaluative event, a, a paper or something like that, uh, we will frequently compare like what was our grade range between the two of us, uh, what was the mean, like some of those basic statistical analysis of grades and make sure that they're fairly consistent. Um, we obviously have access to each other's like grading. So there'll be times where I will look at a paper that Abby evaluated and she's welcome to do the same with mine. Uh, we do not make any decisions on like great adjustments or if a student is seeking some kind of exception or extension for a deadline, that is a decision that is made together. It is never actually made independently. Um, and then we communicate to the student that this was something I discussed with Abby. This is the decision we've come to. So they're not really playing both sides of the fence. They already know that this has been discussed and that we are a united front. Okay, um, Carrie, currently working with a PhD student to co-teach Nursing 200W through the World Campus for the RN to BSN students just started, but really like the concept and so far see many benefits for the students. We are also implementing video feedback as well. That's awesome. That is exactly what we're, what we're going for. That's great. Um, Ray, I see your hand. I think this would be a great opportunity to teach the students how what inter-rater reliability is and what you <laughs> do to improve it. Absolutely. And we, we really try to um, use all of these opportunities to highlight to them and make it, you know, more interesting, more applicable and, and uh, really inspire them throughout the process. You know how that goes, especially in 200 W. Um, we really don't have, I was just sitting here thinking, Abby, we have not had an issue and we recognize that this is still a fairly new process, but we have not had an issue of students pushing back and requesting a different grader or 
stating that they think they would get a different grade. That was nothing that came up in the SRTEs last year. We're getting ready to deploy our mid-course eval, so I guess we'll see what comes up there. But um, knock on wood, that has not been feedback or pushback that we've received so far. And it is interesting. So I have the junior class or the third years in in the fall for 301. And then um, it's kind of like introducing kind of like a skittish group of like wild cats to a new person who says Brie comes in in the spring and I already kind of know them. So they're always a little tentative, you know, when they're getting to know a newer person and I have to be like, she's my friend. It's all good. And by week two, I feel like we are on the same level. They understand that we are in communication. We have the same style, same expectations. So I think that is helpful as well. I try to develop that rapport with them in the fall. So at least half of the faculty they're familiar with, and then um, that kind of helps us to sell this as well. I'm having a hard time keeping up with the chat because there's so many people participating, which makes me so happy. But Kelly, thank you for offering to come speak to our students. Um, yeah. We do indeed have a bunch of 200W sections. The number differs depending on the number of students enrolled in the campus. Um, currently, like I said, we have 60 30 year students and they are all in the classroom with us at the same time. Uh, and so we have 30 each uh, that we are responsible for evaluating. Um, we both attended all of the classes, which has been really nice to have both of us there. We do some in-class activities and there are two faculty members to, you know, round and give feedback and direct them. And it's been nice to, to really tackle that together. Sorry, Brie. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, Leslie is bringing attention to her uh, nursing four night or her N497 course, which is interprofessional palliative care. I understand that's fairly new. Great example of uh, interdisciplinary education there, Leslie, physician, chaplain, um, collaborated on the creation of the course. And to answer uh, Ray's questions, we do not have any exams in this course. It is writing intensive. Uh, we do have two quizzes that are given in class. Uh, we had our first one yesterday. And we follow the same model as all of the other 200W um, courses with that. Um, in three years, the pushback with a grade happened to Kelly and I once because Beth Ann, and, Beth Ann and Kelly teach DNP together. We presented a united front and interestingly enough, came up with almost the same grade. I would, I would be willing to bet that that would be a very similar outcome, um, just because of the use of the rubrics. It's really hard to go off on a limb whenever you have, um, you know, that structure in front of you. So that's you know, I would, I would anticipate the same outcome with us. Thanks, Beth Ann. And I would like to just bring attention to a slide that Abby covered regarding like our current formal research project on this model. And uh, not only do I, like as a PhD student, you know, I enjoy research and it's something that I feel passionate about, but I also think this is a really wonderful opportunity for us to practice what we preach and really role model to the students. Not only are we here teaching you together as people with different educational paths, even though we are, you know, both are nurses, um, we're also like doing the work and putting our strengths together in a way that can contribute to the literature gap that's out there and hopefully inspire others. And we hope that at the end of this project, um, with the help of Leslie as well, that we'll be able to produce something publishable and reach beyond like just our scope here at Penn State. Absolutely. I think we have so much opportunity within our faculty and I've, I've been so fortunate to work with many of our um, PhD colleagues and um, I just think it's, there is a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of um, new opportunities there for us to offer up that complimentary background. So this has been great. Are there any other questions or anything else anyone has to offer to the discussion? While people are thinking about that, I also just want to add um, what Abby spoke about, how we divide the content and like play upon each of our strengths. 
We also make sure to intentionally choose articles and things in the classroom that represent both PhD and DNP prepared authors. Um, so we will highlight, like, this is an article that was published in 2021. The, you know, PI on this was a PhD prepared nurse, look at their credentials, but look, they had a research team and look at the variety of uh, degrees on the research team itself. And uh, especially when we talk about implementing into practice and um, more of those like dissemination steps, we highlight DNP prepared work. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth Ann. I appreciate that. I um, am so appreciative, and I know Bria is as well, for all of you to attend and to be open to this conversation. Um, sometimes it can be a tough one, and it shouldn't be. So I'm really excited that you all were here and we were able to have this wonderful discussion um, and really start thinking about some things that might be a little outside of the box. Um, in this last slide, there is the evaluation link, and I believe Darcy said she would also send it out after the presentation, but you should have a few minutes here if you want to um, click on that evaluation link and make that happen so you get your credit. And thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you so much for your willingness to join us in this conversation. This is not the last time that we will be discussing it, I'm sure. And uh, I'm happy to stick around. I think Abby is too. If anyone has any lingering questions, um, happy to stay connected here um, and you're welcome to move on with your day. Oh yes, and Darcy, could you please put that link in the chat? They might not be able to click on it in this slide. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Darcy.